for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairman, um, and to this panel of witnesses. Um, uh, I, I, I think I'm going to begin with Dr. Barreto. Um, you've conducted a number of studies uh, and published several articles regarding language access for Latino and Hispanic voters. We also heard today about that importance for um, Asian American voters, uh, and I would say, uh, in my experience, for Native American voters where we have several cases in New Mexico where they are required to make sure there are um, Navajo speakers, uh, Kara speakers. Um, but sticking to Spanish language voting, um, why is that so key for Latino and Hispano voters, um, the Spanish language voting materials? Well, thank you, Congresswoman, for that question. Uh, I think you've identified that it is important for any uh, non-English speaking citizen eligible voters but Hispanic and Latino are the largest segment of U.S. citizen adult non-English speakers at numbering over five and a half million. So it is an incredibly large group of folks who are either born in the U.S., perhaps born in Puerto Rico, uh, Spanish is the official language, and then come to the United States to vote in elections here. Those voting materials need to be available in the language that the voter is comfortable with so that they can properly understand all the rules, the procedures, as well as who the candidates are and how to mark their ballot. Numerous political science studies have documented about a 10 point increase in voter participation for Spanish speakers if they have access to bilingual voting materials. So there's no question that empirically it has proven to help boost voter turnout rates of those who are otherwise eligible, um, but perhaps are not fluent in reading and speaking English. And, and your testimony and answer to this question, as well as others, um, really brings us back to the fact that there is also an impact on returning voters, right? That if you are harassed, if you are treated in a way that is different than others when you go to vote the first time, um, that you might not come back. And so that there is a very dangerous uh, possibility of a future suppression. Um, so the Voting Rights Act language access provisions, uh, what kind of uh, impact have they had on uh, uh, Latino and Spanish language voting? Uh, well, where they have been uh, implemented uh, fairly and fully, which is important to note that it is not always implemented fully. There needs to be better oversight of implementation of language access provisions, uh, both section 203 and section 208. But where they have been implemented uh, fully we have seen a higher voter participation rate, both first time voters, as well as you note, of returning voters. One of the most uh, difficult things can be for a voter which has language challenges to navigate the system. And if they don't feel uh, that they can do that, if they don't feel welcomed, if the language materials are not available, as you note, they may just leave and not come back. They may feel excluded from the system. Where section 203 is implemented, there have been very robust increases in Spanish speaking Latino voter participation. Thank you. And based on your research, what do you think are the reasons that Americans, uh, as has been uh, one of the witnesses stated today, might not have faith in our elections? What? Well, uh, faith in our elections is very important. And I would agree with that uh, sentiment. Uh, but it is important that the, those voters who show up to vote uh, don't feel that they're being discriminated against <clears throat> for any reason, whether it is for language, for lack of ID, uh, or being challenged at the polls. When those sorts of instances happen, where voters have a negative experience at the polls and are challenged or are not able to navigate the, the polling place, that leads to a rejection and withdrawal. And so that is an important part of confidence, is having a accessible uh, and uh, confident experience at the polls. Right, and the, the numbers are, are vast in terms of, of what one court has called the infinitesimally small number of uh, evidence of fraud versus the very high percentage of Latino uh, and other language speakers who were turned away. Uh, Ms. Romero Kraft, uh, so existing law, as uh, Dr. Barreto just pointed out, it requires that there be uh, Spanish speaking assistance. What do you believe are the principal reasons that states and localities do not comply with the statutory obligation? 
I think there are a number of reasons, but I think one of the ones that is really a barrier for uh, uh, Spanish language dominant or other um, voters who speak another language other than English is that when they even go to ask, they're turned away. And just as you as rightfully stated, if they're turned away and they don't know where to go, they don't know who to ask to receive assistance, then we may never hear uh, of their complaint. We may never hear of their experience. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes these issues are couched by elections officials as being cost prohibitive. But we, what we have found in uh, jurisdictions all over the country is that there are practical ways that election officials uh, administer their votes and are able to meet those challenges of providing language assistance to voters in, in very uh, ways that are extremely reasonable. For example, in the state of Florida, uh, the, the secretary is required to provide information in Spanish uh, to, in, across the entire state. So the election officials rely on that on those organizations in order to do their job. Thank you, Mr. Romero. Mr. Chair, I'd like to enter two documents into the record. Uh, I seek unanimous consent to enter translating into votes the electoral impacts of Spanish language ballots and voting rights for whom examining the effects of the Voting Rights Act on Latino political corporation. Certainly, without objection, both documents will be received. Thank you. Uh, I yield back. The lady yields back. At this time, the chair will recognize